It is astonishing how little attention critics have paid to story considered in itself. There are indeed three notable exceptions. Aristotle, in the Poetics, constructed a theory of Greek tragedy which puts story in the center and relegates character to strictly a subordinate place. In the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, Boccaccio and others developed an allegorical theory of story to explain the ancient myths. And in our own time, Jung and his followers have produced their doctrine of archetypes. Apart from these three attempts, the subject has been left almost untouched. This is Pints with Jack, Season 7, Episode 13, Lewisian Literary Theory and Northrop Fry, After Hours with Angelina Stanford. Welcome to Pints with Jack, the podcast where we read through the works of C.S. Lewis. And today is an After Hours episode, and today we're going to be talking about C.S. Lewis's literary theory and looking at a man with whom you might not be that familiar, Northrop Fry. Guiding us through this is one of the hosts of one of my favorite podcasts, The Literary Life Podcast. We've had her husband, the mysterious Mr. Banks, on the show before to talk about poetry, but today I'm joined by the no less mysterious, fascinating Angelina Stanford. Angelina Stanford has a master's degree in English literature from the University of Louisiana. For 30 years, she's shared her passion and enthusiasm for literature with students in a variety of settings, everywhere from university classrooms to homeschool co-ops to homeschooling her own three children. In 2020, she and her husband, Thomas Banks, founded the House of Humane Letters, providing classes, conferences, and other resources devoted to recovering the lost intellectual tradition of the Humane Letters. Together with Cindy Rawlings, they host the Literary Life podcast. Angelina Stanford, welcome to Pints for Jack. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk about a, a sadly neglected part of Lewis's life. Exactly. That's, that's what we like to do here. We like to shine a light on some areas that people might not necessarily have looked at, even at all. I've been listening to your podcast, I think, for, it's got to be fairly near the beginning because my sister-in-law she knew I was a Lewis nerd and she was part of a reading group for mothers. And uh, she said that someone had shared your podcast because they were going through one of Lewis's books. And so I went and looked at it and then looked at your back catalog and just got all excited. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of knew when I first started listening to your podcast that we'd have to have a collaboration in the future. As I mentioned, we had your husband on to talk about poetry, but your podcast has so much overlapping content, both regarding Lewis directly himself, but also the books and the authors which formed him. Because we've recently started a Jack's Bookshelf series doing just that to help us understand Lewis. We look at the literature that he himself was reading. Oh, yes. Uh, St. Jack is always in the background when I talk about literature on the podcast or, or conference talks or classes. And uh, we'll explore today why that is. Mm -hmm. And at the time of recording, you just posted uh, uh, an episode which was your year-end wrap-up. And I was very pleased to see that among the nearly 100 books that you've read this year, one of them was Britney Spears' autobiography, and so was uh, the former Prince Harry. <laughs> I have gotten so many comments on, on that. And, and the reason that I did it is because I heard someone on the internet, that's right, this is, this is who you're talking to, someone who's going to respond to negative criticism on the internet. And someone said <laughs> that I was too highbrow in my reading. So I thought, okay, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw a curveball. And the funny thing is I read both of those. I listened to the audios of both of those immediately after finishing a reread of The Discarded Image by Lewis and The Secular Scripture by Northrop Fry. And my head was very heavy and I just thought, oh, I need some, some candy. <laughs> like, what, what, and, and just on a whim picked up those two. And I have to say, Although I am an American, I am a devoted monarchist. Quite right, too. I raged narrated my way through the prince <laughs> formerly known as Prince, the Harry formerly known as Prince. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. Yeah, you can trash Harry anytime on this podcast. I will allow it. But we should do that over <laughs> drinks. I'm having a nice cup of tea since it's a little early in the morning. Are you drinking anything? I have a lovely uh, Earl Grey here, and I'm glad that you're drinking tea too. And I thought, oh my goodness, is he expecting a, a gin and tonic at 9 a.m.? But no, I've got some tea. Sometimes we do do that, you know, suffer for our art. But yes, this morning was a tea morning. Cheers. Cheers. So I provided a very brief sketch at the top of the show, but would you mind just filling in a few more details about yourself, your career, and 
your history with books? Well, I'm a lifelong reader, and I, from a very early age, was drawn to a medieval perspective of literature. Of course, I didn't know that's what it was called until much later. But I got an English degree, I got a master's degree, and when I was in graduate school, to be quite frank, so this was the early 90s, I saw the writing on the wall and I thought, these guys are running off a cliff and I do not want to be a part of this. And I have to say, 30 years later, I have very much been proven right on that. Uh, so I left academia quite to the shock and uh, consternation of many people. Taught in some private school settings. I was involved in founding a school. I homeschooled my my own kids. And then just to my utter delight and surprise, in the homeschooling world, I found people who were interested in reading the same sorts of things and the same sorts of way that I was interested in reading. Uh, I met lots of people who had been soured by the academy and, and modern literary theory, and uh, I ended up sort of finding my home there. So about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, I started teaching classes online and started podcasting, joined the conference circuit. And was doing that just sort of independently. And then when I married Mr. Banks in 2019, and he, of course, was a, was a teacher at a classical school for a long time. And we decided to join forces professionally as well as personally. <laughs> we launched the House of Humane Letters and there's been no looking back. Mm -hmm. What do you do that? We do a lot of things. So we are devoted to the restoration of the lost intellectual tradition, and in particular, the lost literary tradition with the humane letters. And you're going to find out what that is today when we start talking about Lewis. Uh, but we have a, a growing online academy. We have webinars and conferences and mini classes. We do two podcasts, the Literary Life Podcast and the Well-Read Poem. We do retreats. I run a two-year literary mentorship program called the St. Anne's Fellowship, which is a nod to that hideous strength. Mm -hmm. We have a growing number of professors and other academics who are really drawn to the work that we're doing here as well. So it's very exciting. And, and we offer things from middle school to adult. So it's going really well. Yes. And... As I said, I, I think the Literary Life podcast isn't really an honorary C.S. Lewis podcast, given the number of times he appears in commonplace quotes and the books themselves. Would you mind just saying a few words about some of the Lewisian influences on your own life and his various appearances on your podcast? Well, for a long time, I have referred to him affectionately as St. Jack. I don't know if there is such a thing as a guardian literary critics, <laughs> but he's mine. And one of the reasons that I say that is because it, this happens so much. I've come to expect it now. Every time I think, okay, I've got, I've got a new thought here. I've got a new insight into the world of literature that's never been said before. I find that C.S. Lewis said it first and better. Mm -hmm. uh, so that used to really discourage me. I was like, Jack, you're always stealing my thunder. <laughs> but then I thought, no, no, no. This is his pat on the back. This is him telling me, no, you're on the right track. Keep going. Atta girl. So uh, I take it like that. But the funny thing is, I did not read any C.S. Lewis growing up. I did not read the Chronicles of Narnia. Wow. None of that. Uh, I didn't read the Chronicles of Narnia, honestly, until I read it to my children as an adult. I had read the Screw Tape Letters in high school and had really liked it. And then in graduate school, I read Out of the Silent Planet and had also really liked that. But I had absolutely no idea that C.S. Lewis was a literature professor or a scholar or anything like that until after I left academia, I ended up getting a copy of Experiment and Criticism and I read it. And I remember feeling two things at the same time. One, just a breath of fresh air after all that academic reading. I was like, wait, this is a scholar who speaks regular English and makes sense and you can follow. It's not full of jargon and buzzwords. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I felt was anger. <laughs> I was so angry that I had gotten a graduate degree and no one had told me that C.S. Lewis was a scholar. I, I, I felt positively ripped off. And of course, now I know the reason why he's shut out of the academy, but I didn't back then. I was just mad. But that started me on my, my journey with Lewis. I started reading all of his literary scholarship. And the more that I studied literature, and in particular, the theory of literature, the, the more that I saw that Lewis was absolutely at the heart of all of it, really understood it, was teaching it. And I came to see too that, like Tolkien, with whom he was working very closely with these ideas, his fiction really was a deliberate effort to show his theory in his stories. I mean, essentially, both of them got to the point where they realized, I can't explain how stories work anymore. I'm just <laughs> going to have to show you. And they're, they're quite explicit about this in, the, in their letters, too. Uh, it's, it's a real treat for me now to read to reread the fiction and say, oh, I see. I see which literary theory point you're making in this chapter. It, uh, 
So yeah, St. Jack gets a, a lot of attention on my podcast and my classes and my conference talks. Because as I said, usually if I have a point to make, he's already made it and he said it better. So I'll just throw in a quote. I love it. Well, the title of this episode is Lewisian Literary Theory and North Fry. And we'll get to Mr. Fry in a little bit and we'll get to literary theory. But let's let's just begin by situating Lewis in Oxford, part of the Inklings, in his regular job. What was he doing? Well, it's really interesting because Tom Shippey laments, and I share this lament, that what Lewis and Tolkien consider to be their most important life work professionally is the thing that gets the least attention. And that is what they were mm-hmm. doing at Oxford. So to back up a little bit, let's just talk about the, the study of English literature, because as an academic study, that is a relatively new field. It's a 20th century field. So when Lewis and Tolkien are at Oxford in the 1930s, they are on the cusp of what does it mean to study English literature. So this is the fight they're involved in. Up till that time, of course, the university had been devoted to classics. In an ironic twist, it's the United States who's ahead of the, ahead of the curve on this, uh, ahead or backwards. They were, they were, <laughs> it kind of makes sense that America was like, ah, get rid of Homer. What, what is in our own language that we can read? So they were a little bit ahead of the curve there, but also in the 20th century. But Both Lewis and Tolkien and what's going on at Oxford and at what was going on in the United States were all influenced deeply by the work of Germanic philology, and in particular, the work of Jakob Grimm, the most famous philologist. And he was a huge influence on Tolkien, who was a Germanic philologist. And so the study of English literature sort of starts to build on that. So let's say the late 19th century, when English literary texts start to be introduced into the academy, it is not as literature. It is basically as um, artifacts and examples of the development of the English language. So you'd read a little Anglo-Saxon, you'd read a little Middle English and say, oh, look, in that. and that's how we got to modern English. Coming out of the school of Germanic philology, which, of course, is giving a lot of attention to works written in your native tongue, we start to see movements in America and at Oxford to looking at the literary value of these English texts. So in England, Tolkien is going to give the address, The Monster and the Critics, where he's going to say to a room full of English scholars, all of you are reading Beowulf wrong (laughs) and you need to stop treating it as an artifact of history or the development of the English language and instead realize it's a story and it can be read and enjoyed as a story right up there with Homer and Virgil and all the other great stories. Now, when he says you have to read it as a story, this is something that is going to make a modern person very confused. And as I go through like the whole history of what happens after this, it'll make more sense about why we don't know what that means. But when he says that, he means very specifically treating it as a story within the principles of Germanic philology, meaning that this text has a meaning and you can know what it means by looking at the language it's rooted in, the particular people, the culture, the shared metaphors, the shared imaginative backcloth. That's the phrase Lewis gives in the discarded image. But you're putting it in a whole world of meaning And that's how you know what the story means. So in the early 1930s, Tolkien is a professor. And this is going to be a funny story of what happens when one person has tenure and one does not. And Lewis (laughs) is not a professor, right? Lewis is a lecturer. So Lewis is the new guy on on the team and Tolkien's established. And so we've got this burgeoning field of English literature. What does it mean? And Tolkien starts to recruit C.S. Lewis and wins him over to his side. And the two of them designed the Oxford English syllabus for the degree of language and literature. Now, for Americans listening to this, that syllabus does not mean in the United States what it means at Oxford. So really what they're doing is designing the curriculum. They're designing this is the required reading to get a degree from Oxford. And they very deliberately rooted it in old text. So it starts with Anglo-Saxon language. It starts with Beowulf. It starts with old things. And nothing in this syllabus is less than 100 years old. And Lewis defends this at great personal cost, by the way. They make so many enemies over this that this is why Lewis never gets a professorship at Oxford. Hmm. And this will make more sense when I tell you what they're opposing. But Lewis defends this in an essay called Our English Syllabus. And he's got some fantastic snark here. I mean, to me, there's nothing greater (laughs) in the world than just Lewis snark. And you find it really in his literary essays a lot because he does not suffer fools gladly. So he's making the case that, of course, if you're going to study books 
at a university is going to be old books because what is the whole point of going to college? To be led by a professor into hard things that you don't understand. And he says, why on earth would you want to read a new book at a university? He said, you should understand the new books better than these professors. And then he says, and this is pure snark, you're going to love this. He says, going to a university to study modern novels is like hiring a nurse to teach you how to blow your nose. (laughs) So this is the hill for them to die on. Old books studied in this old medieval way where you're putting it in the context of its imaginative universe, and and that's going to tell you what the books mean. This is opposed to what's going on at Cambridge. Cambridge, uh, (laughs) which at its founding was basically, we're not Oxford, we're we're new and cool, (laughs) and they've never stopped. If If you go on their website today, Oxford is like, tradition, Lewis, Tolkien, old stuff, and Cambridge is like, new, shiny, it's still exactly (laughs) like that, innovative. So Cambridge takes the complete opposite view. We're going to design an English literature department that's just new books. So they're just like reading D.H. Lawrence. Forget Beowulf, forget Chaucer, those hacks. We want new books and we want to read them through a Freudian psychoanalytical lens, Mm -hmm. which is obviously the opposite. In fact, Lewis writes an essay against that, a very snark filled essay against Freudian criticism, which he says, no doubt people will tell me that the reason I'm taking this position is because I'm repressed. (laughs) (laughs) Something to do with my mother, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, it's just gold. It's just absolute gold. So the two main guys at Cambridge who are opposing Lewis and Tolkien, and in many ways are the anti-Lewis and Tolkien, are F.R. Leavitz and I.A. Richards, two guys who Lewis calls out by name in his works. I mean, this is very rare for Lewis to name somebody, and he names them more than once. So both Leavitz and Richards get attacked by name in Experiment and Criticism. And Richards, of course, is the target of the abolition of man, that his way of reading and his dealing with language is what's going to make us lose our humanity. So they argue quite the opposite of Lewis. We want new books and we want to read them through a Freudian lens. In fact, Richards presents the opposing view to the quote you read at the beginning of the podcast where Lewis is saying, critics don't want to talk about story as story. They want to talk about everything else, but not the story. Well, he's poking at I.A. Richards because mm. I.A. Richards at Cambridge said, so, so here's Tolkien, story has a value, read it as a story, right? Here's I.A. Richards. There is no value in studying a story for itself. The only value is using the story to talk about other things, namely psychology. He was not an English major. Shock. So (laughs) the Cambridge view is the one that is going to win the day ultimately. At the end of their careers, Lewis and Tolkien are both just really, really disheartened about this. Lewis is going to give that speech at Cambridge where he's going to call himself a dinosaur. And he says, with all this sadness, I really thought that in my own lifetime, we would rein in all the insanity going on right now. We'd get back to real learning, but I can see that that is not going to happen. So they were really sad about that. But what ends up happening? So, so how do we go from this battle with Oxford and Cambridge to everything that's happened you know, in the last 100 years? So it all comes out of this fight between these two camps. Do you have this traditional medieval view of literature and you're going to read old books and you're going to read them the old way? Or, or, or do you think the study of literature is to read new books and to use them to talk about other things? So I.A. Richards... <laughs> is not only going to destroy the world of Germanic philology in England, he's going to cross the pond, come to America, and destroy it here too. And yes, <laughs> I kid you not, my favorite Germanic philologist in the United States, uh, George Lyman Kittredge, who really is like the Tolkien of America, I. Richards goes to Harvard and, and starts to influence the students away from that and toward the new things. And I mean, really, we have a tendency, I think, to look at modern universities and see like, oh, kids today, they don't want tradition. They want the new thing. And um, I always think literally every university from the beginning of the time, that, that is what they do. They're, they all want the new thing. So what comes after I. A. Richards, he ends up influencing a group who calls themselves the new critics which is really funny because it's 100 years old now. And I always tell my students, don't whatever you call yourself, don't call yourself (laughs) new because that is not going to age well. (laughs) The old new critics. Mm -hmm. So the new critics on the surface look like they're saying what Lewis and Tolkien say. They say, okay, we're going to treat story as story. 
But what they mean by that is something radically different than Tolkien means by that, because they think that to read story as a story means to divorce it from that imaginative context that Lewis and Tolkien thought it had to be. And so don't bring in the language, don't bring in the people and the culture and the shared metaphors. Um, instead, they come up with these sort of science, they actually say it's scientific formulas that any reader can come in and apply to any book, and then they'll be able to figure out. The, I, I'm so glad you're laughing at this and not like, yes, this is brilliant. Uh, and it sounds so great. It's a great idea. The one problem with it is it doesn't work. Yeah. This sounds a little bit like a scene from the Dead Poet Society where you get to determine the area under a curve to determine how good a poem is. Yes, I always think about that. And in conclusion, a 4.8. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> the judge from Russia <laughs> scored it a 2. Uh, yeah. So, one of the things that the new critics do is they argue for something that they call close reading. Now, this is one of these things that is so deeply misunderstood. Modern people throw around close reading all the time. In fact, I read a Lewis biography that said Lewis did close reading. And I was like, dude, you don't know what those words mean. You think they mean he paid close attention when he read. You don't realize that close reading actually represents a literary theory that Lewis spent his entire life fighting. I mean, Tom Shippey says in his new Beowulf edition with the appendix that the new critics were Tolkien's lifelong professional enemies. Okay, so, so the new critics are the opposite of Lewis and Tolkien. And what they mean by close reading is really closed reading, that we're going to take each book as a closed system, and we're not going to connect it to a culture and a world of meaning and other literary works where we're going to take them individually. So the New Critics actually don't stay in ascendance for that long. What happens, though, is people began to realize very quickly that if you take a book out of any and all context that gives it meaning, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And so the history then of 20th and 21st century literary criticism is people trying to answer the question, what do these books mean now that they have rejected Germanic philology, which is how you would know what they meant. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to all kinds of things. So, you know, Freudian criticism, obviously. And then you get into um, about the 1950s, you get into the reader response criticism. So people saying, okay, the, the words on the page don't actually mean anything. It's me, the reader. I'm giving the meaning. My feelings are what's giving it the meaning. I've been to Bible studies like this. <laughs> so again, you know how much that works. It's just right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no. It actually mm. kills me that some of these people claim that experiment and criticism is the birth of reader response criticism. And I think you, the reader, have read that book wrong if you think that's what Lewis <laughs> is saying, because he's very opposed to this. You've read it, but your response is wrong. Correct, correct. <laughs> um, so then you get to like the 1960s and you get the French deconstructionists, people like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, who say, Ah, these words on the page, they mean nothing. Your response, they mean nothing also. Nothing means nothing. Meaning doesn't mean it all just means nothing. Oddly enough, that catches on. And so then we go from poor Tolkien and say, Lewis saying, story is important. Read the story to people saying story is not important. What is important is if we are looking through lenses at the story, primarily lenses of power and oppression. So then the rest of the 20th century is dominated by a literary theory that is attempting to look at power dynamics. So you have feminist criticism, Marxist criticism, queer criticism, post-colonial criticism. And then that brings us up into the 21st century with this uh, literary critical theory, which takes this idea that books are nothing more than examples of oppression and ramps it up to the point where they say, then why read these old books at all? We hate all of them. Let's destroy all of literature. Which is pretty much what we deal with day in, day out, because people read old books. It doesn't perfectly accord with their modern Western 21st century worldview. Don't like it, therefore don't read it. That's right. That's right. And I mean, of course, Lewis argues in his uh, introduction to Athanasius that that is the value of reading old books, to put you into another world. Mm. That's precisely what we, what we don't want. Yeah. And in an, in an experiment in criticism, he says, my own eyes are not enough for me. I must see through the eyes of others. That's the point of reading. Yeah. But those others might hurt me, David. Those eyes, that they're oppressive. I, <laughs> stop oppressing me with your other eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the good thing is that nah, there is no such thing as meaning and words mean nothing. And even, even my own response means nothing. Unless it's hurting me, then it means everything. <laughs> there you go. So Lewis and Tolkien are very distraught by the, by the end of their lives. Very distraught because, you know, Lewis dies in 1960s. It's a train wreck by then. Tolkien in the 70s. Literary theory is a train wreck. They both just think, okay, we've lost. 
But what they don't realize is that a very, very important person was a student at Oxford and was very much paying attention to what they were saying and what they were doing. Yeah. So let's talk about him because when I reached out to ask you what you might like to talk about today, you suggested Northrop Fry. And he was someone I knew fairly little about. Pretty much, I would say the sum total of everything I knew about Northrop Fry, I had gleaned from your podcast. So let's, let's switch to him and let's start off just by who, who is he? How is he connected with Lewis? And how is he connected with literary theory? Okay. I'm ridiculously excited to talk about this. I'm going to try to rein in my enthusiasm. It makes sense because I'm about to go full fangirl. Let him free. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go full <laughs> fangirl over, over him. So we have Perfect. St. Jack and we have Uncle Nori. Uh, so... <laughs> Northrop Fry was a literary uh, critic from Canada. He was a professor of literature. He was a clergyman. He was an author. He was incredibly influential, incredibly influential. So influential that even now, as crazy as academia is, people will still reference him. He is still somebody you have to know. Mm-hmm. He died in 1991, the same year as Owen Barfield, actually. And uh, mm-hmm. every time I think about Owen Barfield living to 1991, I want to go back into Time Machine and pull those cigarettes out of C.S. Lewis's mouth. They're just like, you need to live longer. <laughs> Stop killing yourself. And this is the kind of fan fiction scenarios I come up with. So he actually goes, to, so Northrop Fry goes to graduate school at Oxford in the 1930s. At the time when Lewis and Tolkien are hammering all of this out publicly and personally. I have a dear friend who did her thesis work on what Lewis and Tolkien were doing at Oxford in the 30s. And when I told her that Northrop Fry was there at that time, she about she just lost it. She couldn't believe it. She's like, there, this was the moment for him to show up. This is their whole focus. Everything was on literary theory. So here he is. He's not a, a student of Magdalen College. So He's not directly being taught by them, but he's going to their lectures because anybody can go to anybody's lectures. So he's in the audience when Tolkien gives the talk, Monster and the Critics. Mm. He hears it. Okay. Like I, I get great joy in rereading those essays and in the margin writing, fry, fry, fry. Like I can just <laughs> pick out every phrase. I'm like I saw what happened there. He's in the audience when Tolkien gives on fairy stories. He's in the audience when Lewis gives a series of lectures that are later going to become the discarded image. Mm. And everything they're saying completely shapes him. So he comes back to Canada and starts his life as a literary scholar. And in 1947, he publishes his first major work. It's on the poet William Blake, and it's called Fearful Symmetry. And the interesting story behind this is he was trying to answer the question, what does the poetry of William Blake mean? And that led him down into a rabbit hole that he spends the whole rest of his life devoted to, which is the, really the question of how does any literary work mean anything? And so in this book, written in 1947, so this is 15 years before the discarded image comes out as a book, he says his, his thesis for this book is, The reason that you don't understand William Blake is because you don't understand what he's doing. And what he's doing, he says, his whole body of work is an attempt, to quote Fry, to recover what Professor Lewis calls the discarded model. And I love that for two reasons. One, I love that he is taking Lewis's medieval cosmology, imaginative backcloth approach and applying it to the work of William Blake. But I also love that he calls it the discarded model because that means that's what Lewis called it in the lectures way before he rebranded it as the discarded image in the books. So Fry was very, very clearly deeply influenced and shaped by what Tolkien and Lewis were teaching about stories. And in his works, there are a number of references to Professor Lewis. There are a lot of allusions in which he's not directly quoting him, but I've read so much literary theory of Lewis that I think, oh, that was a Lewis paraphrase. That was a Lewis paraphrase. Uh, and, And I've also poured through his notebooks. This is the kind of fangirl I am the volumes and volumes of notebooks. And he talks a lot in there about Lewis and Tolkien and what he calls the Oxford School. And he kind of draws this whole line of literary theory and draws it right through Lewis and Tolkien. Speaking of, you know, things that we can be sad about, one of the great sadness of my life was when I found a letter from 1931 from C.S. Lewis to T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, of course, was a editor and publisher of the journal at the time. And Lewis is pitching to him an idea for a series of articles. And this is, this is what he says he wants to write about. I think it had five parts. And he said, I want to write my neo-Aristotelian theory of literature. 
When I found that letter, I was like, is it somewhere? Is it in a shoebox at the kilns? Can we find this? And T.S. Eliot rejected it. He rejected it. So Lewis, Lewis never wrote it. But that's what he's referencing in that early quote, that only Aristotle gets it right, story as story. And then he goes on to say, the only other people who get it are the archetypal critics. And what he's referring to is actually a woman named Maud Bodkin which we don't need to get into all of that. But she was the first person to write a Jungian archetypal book on literature. Lewis's response to it was very positive. He basically says, like, I don't know if Jungian psychology is true in terms of how the human psyche works, but I think that there are some good insights here about literature. And Northrop Fry, most people call him an archetypal critic. He says he's not Jungian and he's not to call him an archetypal critic is actually to really reduce what he's doing. But he's doing the sort of thing that Lewis is talking about in that quote. He's treating story as story. He's looking at the universal images of it. Fry's career is huge. It's huge and far-reaching and, and very, very influential. Eventually, he writes a book in 1957 called Anatomy of Criticism. So we just talked about the new critics, right? And that they saw literature as a closed system. So he writes Anatomy of Criticism as an opposition of the new critics. And in fact, scholars regularly agree that this, this book was the death knell of new criticism. That was it. This killed it. Boom. Yay. And, <laughs> and in this book, he is opposing the idea that literature is closed. And he says, instead, literature is a world of literature. It's a universe of story. What I say on the podcast is all the stories are talking to each other. And so you're never just reading one book, but each book is really an entryway into the world of stories. And they're all talking to each other. And, and that's what Lewis is talking about in that earlier quote about what it means to treat a story as a story. And, and he talks about how, Fry talks about how we find the meaning in the shape of the story. So it's overall structure. Again, Lewis references this in many, many places and in the universal images and, and you learn what those universals mean in much the same way as a Germanic philologist would, would apply, that this is symbolic language and you can understand the language in terms of the people and the culture and the imaginative context that they share. So really, he takes those core Lewis and Tolkien beliefs and develops them and expands them. And honestly, I think that Fry ends up giving us that neo-Aristotelian literary theory that Lewis wanted to write. I, I really feel like this is it. Yeah, come to fruition decades later. So you've mentioned some of what Fry wrote. If somebody wanted to dip their toe into Northrop Fry, where would you recommend that they begin? So on the podcast, all of this literary theory that I'm talking about, the Lewis, the Tolkien, the Fry, that is what is undergirding everything on the podcast. The way that we approach books and people write and say, I've never heard anybody talk like this before. You're telling us what the books mean and I didn't know it could be like this. And this is such a breath of fresh air after all the insanity of academia. I will inevitably get the question, where can I learn more? Should I jump in and read Northrop Fry? And I always feel a little bit like a jerk with my answer. So at the risk of sounding like a jerk, here's my answer. Northrop Fry is hard. It's really, really hard. Mm. And I tell that to people not to discourage them, but because what happens is they run out and buy Anatomy of Criticism and they open it and they think, what the, what, this is, wow, this is really hard. And so I just want them to be prepared so that they're not discouraged. He is a scholar writing to other scholars. And so I would not jump into Anatomy of Criticism as, as your first starting point, because it is a very difficult book. The honest answer to where is the easiest place to learn about that stuff is our classes. Mm. I've spent a long time studying this, and I really work hard to break these ideas, these Lewis ideas, these Fry ideas down to a beginner level. You will learn this stuff if you take a class from us or, or even a webinar or a mini class. It doesn't have to be like a huge, huge investment. That said, Fry does have a few things that are geared toward a more general audience. So the first place I would start is a very short volume, a very accessible volume called The Educated Imagination. He actually did these, much like Lewis, he did these originally as radio addresses. Hmm. And so they're radio addresses to a, a more general audience and they're published in book form. And they are fantastic, fantastic. Uh, in my fellowship, we read The Educated Imagination alongside the experiment in criticism, like chapter by chapter. And we're just tickled by, by how much they're saying the same thing. In fact, I have to tell you, when I read Northrop Fry's biography, and that was where I found out he was a student, 
of Lewis and Tolkien. I felt such a sense of relief because there are so many times where I think of a quote and I can't remember, did Fry say this or Lewis say this? <laughs> so when I found out he was a student, I thought, okay, this makes me feel a lot better. They're basically saying the same thing. So the educated imagination is a great place to start. The other place I would recommend, it's transcripts of a class he taught on Shakespeare. So again, it's for a more introductory audience and they're absolutely fantastic. And you would be able to see him apply some of these ideas to specific works. Those are both really, really good places to start. Mm -hmm. And I do like your answer because when people, for example, ask me, how do you read Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton? I said, it's great. You start with mere Christianity, you read that, then you would start a little bit of Chesterton, probably the Father Brown thrown in on the way so you, you learn to understand how he speaks. <laughs> For your, um, you said you, you you talk about some of this stuff at the House of Humane Letters. Are there any particular courses or webinars that you think particularly relate to this subject that you would recommend? Oh, this is a great idea. Yes. The How to Read Fairy Tales mini class is the one that I recommend that people start with because it is the foundational class where I lay all of this out. We start with Germanic philology and the Grimm brothers because they're actually applying philology to the fairy tales. And it's called How to Read Fairy Tales, but it's really a crash course in how to read anything, how you know what stories mean, how to read symbolic language, the imaginative backcloth, and you get a whole crash course in Fry Theory, Lewis Theory, the Grimm Brothers philology, the whole nine yards. We've gotten tremendous feedback on that class. It's very, very popular. People do find it extremely accessible. Perfect. Well, I had a, a more personal question. I have two children. They are both very young at the moment. Alexander is two. Lucy's about to be six months. Lucy? You sound like a Lewis fan. What? <laughs> I thought it was subtle enough, though. When we had uh, Alexander, everyone said, are you going to call him Jack or Lewis? So it's like, no, 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 no. But then when we had our second one, I was like, oh, okay, let's call her Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> no Clive? <laughs> no, no, oh, definitely not. No. There once was a child named Clive Staples Lewis, and he almost deserved it. Exactly. How would you suggest I raise them to be good readers? It's kind of funny in... When I've spoken with my wife about, you know, our dreams and aspirations for our children, you know, they've got like a few fairly basic ones of them to love God. Uh, but a very close second is to be readers. And Alexander is, is showing good signs in that direction already. He will very happily sit down and quote unquote read to himself <laughs> uh, for, for a good amount of time. I love that stage. That's so adorable. <laughs> it's even better when you sit down next to him and ask him what the book's about. Some of the answers are just wonderful. Well, what advice would you have for me to raise good readers or for any parents, kids as they, as they grow older? Well, if you listen to my podcast, you know that I'm going to give you a curveball answer. Of course. You're expecting the curveball answer. <laughs> I know that a lot of the received wisdom of the day is that the way to raise readers is to read to them. That was not my childhood experience. I don't have memories of being read to, although I think I was. And I have children who are readers, and I don't think it was because I, I read to them. I, I have strong feelings that that is not the case. I later read a study on this and found that there is science to back me up, that when you look at people who read, being read to is actually less of an indicator than the fact that you have books in your home. Mm. Right? I find that fascinating. And so I definitely have memories of my parents having books. I played with them. I used to play library. I made little library <laughs> cards and made my siblings check them out. Like I, I love books so much. Uh, yes, total nerd, total nerd. I, I love the feel of books, everything about them. And we did not have money. So if anybody's listening and like, oh, the <laughs> owning books is for rich people. No, we were so, so poor. We were so poor, but we had books. And my mom took us to the library, but we owned books and owning our own books was really important. Of course, my kids grew up with a lot of books in the home. And I've thought a lot about that, that study. You know, what does it mean to have books in the home? And I think it must be that there's a culture there where the family values books and somehow that, that gets into the kids. And I can remember when, and maybe, maybe your kids have done the same thing, but I can remember when my kids were little, so my, my two oldest are about the same age difference as, as your two, and I have a, a boy, I have an Alexander. <laughs> it's his middle name. My brother is Alexander, so my son has Alexander as his middle name, and then, and then his little sister, and they're about the same age difference as yours. But I remember them being just infants even, and crawling over to the sofa, sitting down, grabbing a book, and lying exactly in the spot I would lie, in exactly the way, and <laughs> pretend to read. And 
they were imitating me. And I remember just being so tickled by that and thinking, but they're getting the message that this is what a human being does as part of our life. We, we read books. We're always around books. We shop for books. And, and so it's just really a part of our, of our family culture. And they've all come to, to love books in their own way. And then of course, the second, I'm over here equivocating on the word good, like a good reader. Like, so how do you read the right way, right? That too. And, and I think that a lot of parents in their eagerness can sort of destroy the beauty of the relationship between the child and the book, like asking too many questions and what's the moral and where did you see Jesus in this story or what's the virtue? And just like, you know, all the workbooks out there in the world, sit there with a new criticism, you know, close reading formula. What's the theme? What's the plot? Let's chart it. That's just going to destroy it. So keeping it something to be loved and enjoyed and delighted in, letting them tell you in their own words what they're reading not not expecting them to have the right answers. I mean, I, I think that's where it all starts. That's where it started with Lewis, right? Curl, you curl up with mm-hmm. a good book. That's that's it. I think if you have that relationship of love and feeling like the world of books is kind of magical, you're going to want to spend more time there and you're going to want to start to explore the, the rabbit holes. Like, why does the knight always do mm-hmm. this? What does that mean? And I wonder, oh, I've noticed in several books, it's always this. I wonder what that means. And, you know, and that's how I got into all of this, trying to answer those questions for myself. Why do I keep seeing this happen in the book? Why, what does that mean? Mm. Your answer has got lots of echoes in Lewis's life. Surprise, surprise. In Surprise by Joy, he talks about uh, all of the books around his house and that he was sure to find one that he'd never seen before in the same way that one finds new blades of grass on the lawn. And that was certainly true for me. Uh, again, my parents didn't have a whole lot of money, but there were books everywhere. And I remember the delight of coming across, you know, through lots of boring books, when you come across one that you love, the joy of the find. It's the same thing why going to secondhand bookstores are, is so much more fun than going to a Barnes and Noble. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to find. I'm also not sure where I'm going to find it. You know, I'm digging through one, one genre and something was misfiled, but this book looks really interesting. The hunt, man. Yeah, it's the this, hunt. It's like the thrill <laughs> of the hunt. <laughs> Even now with Alexander, he will come into my room. And so behind me is most of my Lewis uh, collection of books that he wrote and books about him. He always goes to the Chronicles of Narnia and opens them up to look for pictures of horses. Even though that he's only looking for the pictures at the moment, I do love that, that he's, he's coming into my collection looking for things that he's going to like. And speaking to your point about asking too many questions, uh, yes. When grown-ups are, are a little bit too interested in what you're doing, and you get the suspicion that, wait, I think they're trying to teach me something. No, don't like this. Don't like this at all. But one of the things that my mother did, because I was, uh, I did took the dyslexia test at, at 10 and passed it with flying colors, so to speak. But one of the things that my mum always encouraged was just to keep me reading, and she didn't really care what. And what I ended up settling on were the Willard Price books. It's like Tiger Adventure, Lion Adventure, Shark Adventure. And it's basically Hardy Boys, but with animals. And that was what I just kept reading, and she seemed perfectly fine with that. I certainly found a good deal of freedom in that. It, It meant that I could read a book simply because I enjoyed it. Not necessarily because it had to be sort of the right sort of book or an important book. Those came later. Oh, yeah. No, my, my childhood is the same way. I mean, I, it was a huge rite of passage in my family to get your library card. <laughs> yes. The requirement in my hometown way back then is you had to be able to write your name in cursive. That was it. That was the only requirement. Wow. So talk about light a fire <laughs> under me to learn how to write my name in cursive. Okay. It's a big deal. All, the, all these adult library cards with the, the shaky second grade <laughs> handwriting, you know, the good old days before it was computerized. But getting that library card was such a big deal. And my mom gave me total freedom to check out anybody. I don't ever remember my parents saying, no, not that book. It's too hard or, you know, it's not good enough. And again, with all the accusations that I'm so highbrow, I've always been a balanced reader because, I mean, I can remember reading every single Nancy Drew book in the library. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's hardly a <laughs> grand literature there and, and loved them and 
ended up being a gateway to Dorothy Sayers and a whole world there. Exactly, yes. Like my wife, you love uh, detective fiction. And so my my wife disappeared down the Father Brown hole. She also uh, did the same with Dorothy Sayers and Miss Marple, pretty much all of Agatha Christie. There's usually a murder between most of the books that she reads. So she'll read something uh, a little tougher and then there's usually somebody being killed and the crime being solved by either an, an old lady or some kind of religious person. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. You know, one of the points that Lewis makes in Experiment and Criticism, and I find myself telling this to parents a lot because parents of young children, and I'm sure you can know what I'm talking about, feel so much anxiety, right? And you want to do right. And, and the anxiety is well-meaning. Mm-hmm. You want to do right by your kids. And that is a good thing. But you can also make yourself insane with this anxiety. And one of the things that I see parents so worried about is making sure that only, quote unquote, the right book gets put in front of their kid's face as if like reading one wrong book is going to ruin them forever. And and I, so I always quote Lewis on this and you really, it, it perplexes people because it's so different from the way that we think of them. But, but Lewis's point in experiment and criticism is it's not about good books and bad books. It's about good reading mm. and bad reading. And if you're a good reader, you can find something of value even in a not great book like me and Nancy Drew. <laughs> and, you know, Lewis, Lewis read lowbrow things too. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he loved King Solomon's Minds yeah. and things like that. And that's his point. If you're a good reader, you can find something good in the bad book. And if you're a bad reader, you're going to read a good book and not get anything out of it. And so that's really what we should be trying to cultivate is, is being good readers. I think that's a perfect point to end. Angelina Stanford, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I don't get to talk about this stuff very much. I mean, just every day, but not with you. So this was a lot of fun. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, I hear the landlord ring the bell for final drinks. So can you please tell us where people can go to find out more about you and listen to the Literary Life podcast? Well, you can find our podcast in all the usual places, Spotify, Audible, iTunes, et cetera, et cetera, all all the new places every day. And you can also uh, find out more about the podcast on the podcast website, uh, theliterary.life. And you can also go to houseofhumaneletters.com to see all the things that we've got going on there and, uh, you know, jump into the world of Lewis literary theory. (laughs) That's probably the best way to sell it to our listeners. (laughs) (laughs) Find out the secret world of C.S. Lewis at the House of Humane Letters. (laughs) Well, thanks again to Angelina for coming on the show. Thanks to our sound engineers, Taylor and Sarah, our intern, Julia. And thanks to all of our listeners and Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Alex, James, Matt, Erica, Joelle, Amanda, Thomas, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Gary, Stephen, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. We pray for our listeners every week, and particularly all of the prayer requests in our Slack channel. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please go and subscribe to the Literary Life podcast and binge their back catalogue on C.S. Lewis. And join us again next time, when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.